All right. Well, thank you very much. I was wondering if he got a free breakfast or something with his dedication. I think he would be ready for one about now. He looks like a great little guy. Uh, we love grandbabies uh, because we're getting into that era ourselves, and uh, we have two now. Uh, one's a two-year-old, and one is about a one-month-year-old. And they, one, the oldest one, uh, is a boy, my daughter's little boy, and the girl is my son's. Uh, and so it's funny just how the things we've learned. We tried to get Landon prepared uh, for Grayson as she was coming, you know. And so we talked about her and described what she was going to be like, and told him about her being in. His, uh, the mom's tummy, and so finally she's born, and we some they take him in to to see her, uh, and they say, "Okay, Landon, this is this is Grayson," and he goes, "No, <laughs> <laughs> like like that's the wrong one. <laughs> you, you've got the wrong baby here. That's not at all what I had pictured. I don't know whether he had pictured somebody that could run and play with him or or what, but uh, it's kind of funny. But he's he loves her now and. He's doing well. Uh, he's he's an adventuresome guy, like I know I do when Junior is adventuresome. Uh, the other day, about a couple of weeks ago, uh, he was outside, and uh, he can't quite swim yet. He thinks he can uh, because he has his water wing things on, and so when he's in the pool, you know, he thinks he can swim everywhere. So, um, so one day he was out. Uh, side not not intending to swim at all but he was he was riding a, b a bike outside and all of a sudden I guess I wasn't there but he took off for the pool uh, and he rides his bike his uh, not a bike a trike uh, a tricycle uh, straight into the pool okay on it and so he goes under and the bike floats a little bit because the tires float and uh, he's under the water and he's trying to swim, you know, like he knows how to do, but he can never really break through the water. So he's always like a few inches under the water. And so his dad's out there w real close by. And uh, so his dad reaches over and, you know, and grabs him up and lifts him out of the pool and, and gets him on the side. And uh, the first words out of his mouth was, again, <laughs> like, <laughs> I want to do it again. <laughs> So that's kind of his nature. So you can <laughs> imagine the things that we're in for as we <laughs> move forward. But uh, children are a real blessing. They, they bring such great life, I think, in the midst of where they are. Uh, I think God has ordained that to be true. Uh, they just represent potential and destiny and purposes. And uh, we see that, I think, when, when children are born and uh, when they're young and when they're around. Uh, so so we really love babies. I got to see uh, Tanel uh, and hold her little one who's about that size. He's about, about a year old. How old is Dominique? Six months. Six months. Okay, well, uh, the little um, um, BZJD, I call him. <laughs> Boaz Zion Josiah Dickens, all right, is his actual name. But... Uh, uh, Boaz, he's a he's a hefty little guy too, but but uh, he's they're doing well. So they're a lot of fun, a lot of life. So we enjoy that. Well, I'm uh, excited to be with you today. Uh, we always love to be here at Impact with Pastors Gordy and Angie, and uh, like to see what the Lord's doing in your midst, and uh, be here uh, to bring a word of encouragement of what. Uh, God wants to release to you for this season. Uh, Shelly's not with me. She's with me here, uh, and hopefully she'll be with us maybe tonight uh, at the service, uh, or or at least by tomorrow. Uh, she we went and uh, we were in. We've been in inner city Philly. That's where we've been for the last couple of days, and um, uh, we went to a restaurant and ate. And she thinks that maybe she got something that wasn't good there. So uh, that's what happened to her. So. She's, uh, I dropped her off by the hotel as I was coming here today, but hopefully she'll be here uh, maybe tonight and you'll get to see her. Well, I want to uh, uh, share with you something th this morning that the Lord uh, has put on my heart uh, concerning Christianity uh, and concerning authentic Christianity. Look at somebody and say authentic Christianity. Where we were at in uh, Philadelphia was that we were there for the wedding of um, 
Desiree Fox. You know who she is? Yeah. Desiree's son, uh, Alton, uh, was married to uh, Julie, uh, and her last name is uh, about as long as the alphabet, but it's Ten Pitakapong, I think, or something like that. She's from Thailand, uh, or native Thailand, so she has quite a name. Uh, I joked with Shelly. I said, oh, Shelly, yeah, Shelly, I think she's, when we were getting ready to write out their things, you know, it's like a lot easier to write Fox, all right, uh, <laughs> than her last name. And I said, oh, yeah, I think I think she's going to keep her last name in part of it. So it's going to be Julie Fox. <laughs> but I don't think she's really doing do that. But uh, So th we had a lot of fun uh, with them, and uh, we were in uh, inner city uh, Philadelphia, but we were around some people, uh, some from Guyana, uh, near South America, uh, and some from Toronto, and just some, just a lot of different locations and places. And, and when they found out that we were in ministry, of course, they always have questions, you know. Uh, people on the fringes of Christianity uh, have a way of looking at things and seeing things uh, that's just interesting. You know, it's interesting as we want to be those that uh, evangelize, it helps to know how people perceive things sometimes uh, in order to how to speak truth to them uh, in a way that they can hear and, and can receive and things. So, so always, uh, usually what happens is I get questions about someone that's been in major headlines of Christianity, usually about failures, you know, uh, where there's been moral failures or uh, you know, like the situations, this one person remember Jim Baker and some of the things like that. But, but one of the uh, individuals asked me, uh, he said, uh, what do you think about Joel Olstein? He said, I really like Joel Olstein. Uh, now, I'm not uh, sure if this uh, man was born again. Um, I would say probably not. Uh, but um, he said, I really feel good, you know, uh, after, after listening to him. And and uh, I, he said, I would say that he's like more like a motivational speaker. And I said, yeah, I'd, I probably would agree with that, you know, and uh, said that Joel has a lot of good things and teaches a lot of good things and, uh, and um, scriptural things that are valid and true. Um, but I thought that uh, probably uh, if that was maybe the only exposure of what he thought Christianity should be, it would give you a certain expectation, uh, a certain uh, way to look at things uh, that uh, may or may not be true, all right? Uh, because I, I don't agree with Joel on a lot of his doctrinal positions. Uh, and But I didn't necessarily tell this man that because I thought if he's, if he's listening to him, at least, you know, that's, that's better than nothing, you know? And, and uh, it was funny because um, they were relatives of Desiree, uh, and, and uh, so she asked him, she said, are you coming to church? You know, because they were going to be over uh, this morning, are you coming to church today? And they, they said, well, yeah, she said, he, say, he said, he's kind of character anyway, he said, he said, yeah, he said, we, we talked about that, and we've been thinking about that, but you can just kind of tell, tell that he was not making any commitment uh, to say yes, that they were coming, you know, and, and then I was sitting next to him, and then I said, and yeah, and then he's going to turn on Joel, and he, and, and he laughed, but that was probably the truth. Uh, but um, uh, the message that uh, is portrayed uh, is one of success, uh, one of, uh, I would say, somewhat ease uh, in terms of finances and health, even though they've been through some major health battles. Uh, his mom you know, was healed from cancer in a very powerful way. His dad was a tremendous deliverance minister uh, and walked in that realm. Uh, but yet the message that he brings to the body of Christ uh, is a message that uh, obviously he believes that's what he should be doing, I think, and that's what he does, and he makes it very uh, narrow, I would say, in the way that he does that, all right? Uh, but in the, at the same time, he's found in some ways a lot of success doing that, all right? Uh, in terms of finances, in terms of exposure, in terms of gaining access to places and cities and, and you know, the uh, arenas opened up to him to uh, have 
uh, weekend uh, events and things like that. But, but, he, but I do know that uh, he has some really wrong perceptions about some things. Uh, and I was shocked about uh, one in particular that I heard not too long ago. And I, this one I heard myself, so I know that it's true. Uh, and uh, he was on a show, and he w w was with Piers Morgan. And if you know who Piers Morgan is, he's like a real kind of, uh, uh, I, don't w I don't know if irritating is the right word, but uh, he's one that gets to a wants to get to a point and will just like hammer you until he gets to the point that he's trying to get out of, out of him. And, of course, some of the popular topics in the body of Christ and in the uh, political realm today uh, and around the world, uh, one is homosexuality, right? And so they were really trying to narrow and hammer Joel and Victoria about their position on homosexuality. And, uh, and Joel came out and said that he believed that homosexuality was a sin. Uh, but then, to my surprise, they asked him another question. They said, well, now, if a friend of yours uh, was going to uh, have a homosexual marriage, uh, would you go to the marriage? And, I and they asked Victoria this first. Uh, and she goes, well, she said, uh, I guess so. I guess if I was free, I would go. Uh, and then they asked Joel the same thing, and, and he had basically the same response, uh, that they would go if it was a friend, because they wouldn't want to hurt the friend's feelings, uh, was their bottom line position that they believed was the one they were acting on. And I thought, um, that's really sad, you know, because if, if that part of the message is getting out, with the rest of this good message, of feeling good and succeeding and overcoming and those kind of things, you get uh, a polluted gospel, right? Uh, you get one that seems to endorse things that are not right, that God calls an abomination and that uh, I can see no truth in Scripture uh, where we would uh, lend any support uh, to any kind of a ceremony that would endorse that as being right either legally or ethically or in any other way. And so uh, I just wanted to share that because, of number one, to say I like Joel Osteen. I think he does some great things on one hand. On the other hand, uh, I'm really concerned about some of the doctrine and some of the things that uh, they would seem to promote. Uh, my, my bottom line answer and reason for it uh, is that uh, probably they have a lot of homosexuals in the church, all right? Uh, and there's a lot of money that would come uh, in that way. Uh, and they never want to be exclusive about anything, and they always want uh, people to, you know, to be brought in made and to be made to feel good. Uh, it would be interesting to me to know how many uh, homosexuals have converted uh, under that ministry. Uh, and also, if there are many that have been there five, ten years uh, and feel very comfortable as they are in the relationships they're in, uh, still attending that church. If that's true, probably there's a dimension of truth that's not right, all right? Or at least there's a dimension of truth that's been diluted to a point uh, that it's not effective anymore, all right? In terms of really what the mission of the church is, I believe. Uh, because really, uh, the message of the gospel wasn't necessarily one of ease, right? Uh, and it really wasn't even necessarily one of seemingly success in some ways that we measure success. If we look at the life of Jesus, if we look at the life of the apostles who were, you know, all killed uh, for what they believed in, uh, it's a little bit different than what is portrayed many times uh, in the earth and the messages of some uh, popular teachers in the body of Christ about what the message of the true message of the gospel is. So I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about that uh, and about authentic Christianity. Look at your neighbor and say authentic. All right. I think that what the Lord wants from us uh, is for us to be authentic all right? uh, in the things that we do and the gospel that we represent. Uh, it means that sometimes we uh, have to stand strong. 
you know, I, you know for, with the example I use with homosexuals, doesn't mean we don't love homosexuals, doesn't mean that, uh, that we uh, treat them badly, uh, but it does mean that we should never uh, condone uh, sin and uh, give anyone the impression that it's okay and you're okay uh, in that lifestyle uh, because it's enough to take someone to hell for eternity. All right? uh, and, and setting in most of our churches across the U.S. this morning, uh, even though most of the people would never say they were atheists uh, or agnostic, uh, probably a, a good number, and could be over half, I would say, uh, have enough uh, agnostic views or atheist views uh, that they probably are going to hell because they've never been born again. Right? I believe probably there's, there's fewer people in our churches at large in the U.S. that are really born again that are not, that are, that are not born again. All right? And so... Uh, the one thing that's going to mean something in the end is that there's going to be two groups of people, uh, believers and non-believers, and no one uh, will enter into the kingdom of God unless we have had a born-again experience personally uh, where uh, we with our own heart have believed, we with our own mouth uh, speak uh, and validate that belief in our heart. And, and that can happen in a lot of different ways. Uh, for people, and God has a way of reaching people and touching people, and most of you, those that are visitors here, haven't really heard my testimony, but uh, the Lord spoke to me as an unbeliever in a drug culture, uh, and uh, it's true, got me in the kingdom, all right? Uh, I believed in my heart that God was real. I said it's true, uh, and then in that instant, I was taken from a kingdom of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of light. I didn't know what happened to me. I didn't know what born again meant. I didn't know the terminology. Uh, but I had the experience, all right, uh, and that was a real deal, and that's been, uh, I guess, 33 years ago now, uh, and uh, it stuck, okay? So, uh, but it does say that we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth, and that, that uh, does something to cause us to be shifted from one realm, the realm of darkness, to the realm of light, when we believe that Jesus is who he said he was, uh, that he paid the price that... Uh, uh, he said he paid for us, and we really believe that. Uh, then something new happens. We become a new person on the in inside. Old things passed away, uh, and we become really a different person, right? Uh, the old person really is dead. Uh, that's why uh, some of the uh, uh, things that we do are not just uh, ceremonial like a dedication, uh, but it's a covenant with God. It's a vow to the Lord. Uh, to commit a child to the Lord for the length of his days, and he'll progress through water baptism uh, at the right time when he personally makes that choice to be born again. Uh, when we're water baptized, we put the, says the old man is buried under the water, and we rise to newness of life as a new person and a new creature. And so uh, those are some of the basic tenets of Christianity that are very important today, uh, and that we're losing some of those, all right? Uh, we're losing some of those in, in the church at large today. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it was very um, real in the New Testament to see a person uh, born again, water baptized, filled with the Spirit, all on the same day, all right? It didn't take years and years and classes and classes uh, to get people ready for it. It was just something that... Uh, was uh, followed confessing and being a believer. And of course, there are those uh, in the earth today that are paying a tremendous price uh, to be a Christian. You see it uh, throughout the Middle East and Africa and uh, some of the uh, Asian nations as well. Uh, you see it uh, stretching into uh, parts of Russia and, and, and that realm that people have to pay a price uh, to become a Christian and say, uh, that, that you are one. So I want to talk to you about being authentic as a Christian, and I'm going to have you uh, look at a scripture with me in Revelation chapter 3 and 14. Revelation 3, 14. And this is a scripture that we've probably heard uh, several times maybe in our life uh, and maybe even have spoken it a few times. Uh, but I just, just found out something really 
knew about this brought a tremendous amount of revelation about what was being spoken here. And this uh, has to do with the message to the church at Laodicea. Uh, and after let's look in, uh, uh, yeah, we'll start in verse 14, uh, Revelation 3.14. And it said, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have not become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you, buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich and white garments, that you may clothe yourself and that your shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and the, and the eye salve to anoint the eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone bears, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne and he who has an ear to hear what the spirit says to the churches all right now i don't bring that as a rebuke to impact christian center or uh, to you guys today and i want to really center in on uh, the first part of that scripture but you had to kind of hear the whole thing to put it in context but basically here uh, the lord says i wish it that you would either be hot or cold uh, but because you're lukewarm I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, all right? Now, that has always been puzzling to me, all right? Uh, I mean, if hot's good and cold's good, uh, how can lukewarm be so bad, all right? I mean, cold seems to, if you have to progress one way or another, and, and generally in Christianity, we think being hot and being on fire for God's a good thing, all right? And we think that being cold and not on fire is not a good thing. Uh, so it would seem like that lukewarm would come where, somewhere in between rather than God saying, uh, if you're hot or cold, you're okay, uh, but if you're lukewarm, you're not. You know, it just doesn't make sense on a progression, right? And so it never did to me until I found out a little more uh, about some of the things that are around uh, the scripture. Uh, it was uh, very interesting that, that near uh, Laodicea, uh, there were two other cities that were very significant cities, all right? Uh, one uh, was called Hierapolis, uh, and this was a place where they had hot springs, okay? And so many people came for miles to go to these hot springs uh, and bathe in the springs and soak in the springs. They thought they were therapeutic and like some of those hot springs we have uh, here in the U.S. and other places. Uh, and so it was a very good thing, uh, these hot springs, all right, uh, and, and it benefit, benefited people in a great way, all right. There was another city uh, that was also relatively close uh, called Colossa. Uh, now, Colossa had just the opposite. Uh, rather than having hot springs, they had very cold, uh, pure streams uh, where people would also come there, but they would come there for the water. Uh, to drink. It would be like the, the cold wells like we have in Florida, a place called Silver Springs where uh, you can look down a, a hundreds of feet uh, to see this spring at the bottom uh, and it puts out millions and millions of gallons a day, enough to make a whole river look like it's running. All right? uh, and it's, it's really quite an amazing place. Uh, but it puts out very cold water uh, and so this a uh, place called Colossa had these kind of springs that many people went to, all right? And so now Laodicea gets this great idea, all right? Hot springs are good. Cold springs are good. Uh, what if we had them both here, all right? Uh, all the people would come here, all right? And so they did a massive engineering project, all right, that was really quite amazing uh, for that time period. 
And you know what they did? They piped the waters in to Laodicea, right? Uh, and so from uh, Hierapolis, they piped in the hot water. Uh, from Colossa, they pi piped in the cold water uh, and brought it to the city. Uh, to th and they thought, wow, this is going to be a great thing, uh, and people are going to you know, really uh, want to come here instead of going to the other places. And so there was only one problem, uh, and that was by the time they piped it for miles uh, through these clay pipes, uh, it wasn't cold anymore, right? Uh, the cold water became lukewarm, all right? Uh, the hot water that got piped through these pipes also became lukewarm, all right? And then the worst part about it was, was that they used clay pipe uh, to do all this, so by the time it got there, it had picked up this putrid taste from the pipe, all right? And so the first time anybody tasted this water out of this pipe, it was lukewarm and it tasted horrible, all right? And so people spit it out of their mouth uh, as soon as they would taste it. But uh, there's something I believe that the Lord is saying uh, to us in this passage of Scripture, uh, and that is... We have to be authentic to who we are, all right? Uh, you can't be like uh, Hierapolis if you're not Hierapolis, right? And you can't be like Colossa if you're not Colossa, right? Uh, Laodicea needed to be Laodicea, all right? Whatever they had, whatever assets they had, uh, whatever things the Lord had given them to be successful, uh, that's what they needed to do to be successful, and because they had done all these other things, and it sounded like they were kind of a wealthy place to begin with, uh, because he, he kind of addresses them on their wealth, um, they wanted it all, it sounds like, all right? Uh, if somebody else had something good, we're going to take it and we're going to make some money off this, you know, and same way. Now, unfortunately, that happens in Christianity, all right? Uh, money is big business in Christianity, all right? multi, multi million billions of dollars of money uh, is involved in Christianity in books and sales and promotion and uh, CDs and music and you know just any realm you can think of uh, there's tons of money uh, that's involved there and so it doesn't mean that all of that's wrong I don't think but it does mean that if any of that has our heart or if, or if we are piping things in to our life to make money, uh, you know, God spits those things uh, out of his mouth, all right, uh, because they're not, they're not necessarily good. Um, I believe that, you know, we need more influence in, in every realm of society. I'm, I'm big on Seven Mountain Kingdom influence, and wherever you are, you should be influential, and uh, there should be people in charge and in control and making money and handling money. So I, I believe all of that's good. But uh, just for you personally, uh, how many of you have ever said, I'm going to have you raise your hand, but <laughs> how many of you have ever said, oh, man, I just wish I had an anointing like that person, you know, or I wish I just had an anointing like that person, or I wish I could do this, or I wish I could do that, uh, and maybe even tried to model that in some way, all right? Uh, and it doesn't mean we can't set under an anointing and receive from that anointing and do things like uh, people do. Uh, CI is, is a great demonstration of that. Uh, Bishop Hammond had a, had a, has a tremendous anointing in the prophetic, uh, and we found that that can be multiplied uh, over and over again to people and, and uh, cities and states and nations of the world. Uh, and it's very effectual, and it works. So in that way, th it's not a bad thing. Just to uh, give you a little update on Bishop, most of you uh, probably know that Mom Hammond uh, went to be with the Lord just within the last uh, week or so, uh, and that uh, it's a very new season for Bishop. Uh, Mom Hammond was, was the love of his life, uh, and uh, it seemed, though, as so many times that uh, especially over these last, you know, two two years and and up to five years, uh, there was there was almost like a roller coaster ride of her living and not living and living and not living. And so uh, it's been a long season, I think, for Bishop to walk through that. Uh, and so uh, pray for him, pray for God's grace just to be on him and 
into this next season of all the things that uh, we know the Lord has for him to step into, but uh, it's not an easy season uh, for him, and uh, it'll be one that will take some time to walk through it and, and get to the other side. So uh, so really pray for him. The family, the family seems to be doing good. It's kind of funny. Um, we were with uh, Mom the night before she went to be with the Lord, uh, and she, by that point of time, she'd kind of been in, uh, coma for a couple of days but there were a lot of people there coming in and out and Bishop loves people so uh, they're the kind of family that wants everybody there and everybody around and different than probably my family would be or maybe yours uh, but, but there were like in the hospital 50 and 100 people uh, at a time uh, would be there they had one room and a waiting room on the other side. There were kids running down the <laughs> aisles. And I mean, it was just like a, you know, like a family uh, picnic in some way, you know. Uh, but and people going in and out, of course. And of course, mom was not communicating in uh, consciousness really at all with with any of them at that point of time. And so then later that night, uh, everyone left, and Bishop and Sherwin stayed uh, in the room. They had a place for him to stay in the room and. Bishop said that he was up, it was about seven or so, and he thought, well, I'm just going to uh, uh, lay down for just a second, but he fell asleep, uh, and Sherilyn was sitting up next to the bed, and, and of course, she was sending out texts, and she was doing things, and uh, so she s uh, said she sent a text out, and, uh, you know, mom was okay, and she was breathing, sent another text, looked up, and she wasn't breathing anymore, so she got Bishop up uh, really quick, and so Bishop said to me later, he said, yeah, he said, mom probably thought Bishop's asleep and Sherilyn's working. This is a good time for me <laughs> to, to get out of here. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of what happened. But uh, for her, uh, it, she had been really desirous to go and be with the Lord. Uh, I think that she had been become uh, really weary with uh, all of the battles and didn't want to do any other further dialysis or anything at that stage. So. Uh, so she was ready to go, and, and she had expressed that many times, called the family all together. So it was a great homegoing service that we had for her. Uh, played some of the old songs that she used to sing. It used to be when they traveled, uh, she would sing and Bishop would preach, all right, uh, for years and years. That's the way it was. So they played some of the very old songs of the, the probably, oh my, I don't know what era that would have been, I guess, the maybe the 40s or uh, 50s something like that probably so but it, it's good but yeah but continue to pray for bishop and and all of the family during this time amen all right well let's talk a little bit about uh being authentic and and what that means for us uh because you know what the enemy will always try to challenge you in your authenticity all right and and what i mean by that is uh, the very anointings, the very giftings that God's given to you, uh, the enemy, of, of course, will want to squelch those, all right, or want to stop those in one way or another, all right? Uh, so, you know, if God's given you the ability to sing, uh, the enemy will probably attack your voice, you know? Uh, if he's called you to speak, he'll attack your voice. I know that one. Uh, and so, and, and other things, uh, very similarly, it will be like that. So uh, once you find out what your giftings are and where your anointing is, you can also know that probably there's going to be some warfare uh, for you to be that authentic Christian, all right? It's not going to be easy uh, because the enemy knows that you carry a great uh, ability to impact through the anointings that God's given to you. Right? It's more than just you. Uh, it's God in you, and God in you can do great things right? uh, in every realm and successful ways and ways of promotion and increase and marketplace ministry uh, and all of those realms. Uh, just because Jesus is alive within you, there is dunamis dynamite, miracle working power, uh, and we need to k remind ourselves of that over and over again. Right? We don't have to go to uh, Colossa to get it. We don't have to go to Hierapolis to get it, all right? Uh, right here, if uh, we were in Laodicea, we have it, all right? Uh, and we can act upon it and move out into it. But one of the things uh, that happens 
uh, is that I really believe that uh, God is looking for leaders, uh, and I think we sang a song even this morning that, that was uh, uh, kind of directed this way. Uh, God is looking uh, for individuals, people, leaders, uh, who are ones that are really after God's heart, right? And you know that each one of you are a leader, right? Uh, in, in some way or another, uh, God has put leadership within you to be influential in homes, in, at jobs, uh, maybe in uh, church settings and organizations, uh, but maybe in some other completely different realm. Uh, there's a leadership ability uh, that God's put within you, and so he wants our heart uh, to be after him, and he wants us to be one that uh, is really seeking him with a whole heart. Let me turn and just read a, a scripture to you that you don't have to turn there because I know you've heard it and know it and even and you have it on, written on your door, so that's how I know that uh, this is true. Uh, there's a scripture in Jeremiah 29 uh, that says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope, and then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. All right? And so God's promise to us is we will find him if we search for him with our whole heart. All right? uh, he doesn't promise anything other than that. Uh, but the good news is that's true, uh, and it always works. You know, God doesn't want to hide from you. Uh, he wants to be there with you. He wants to fight with you in the battles that you're in. Uh, he wants you to have victories in truth. Uh, he wants you uh, not to be uh, uh, lukewarm in any way and not to feel that you have to take on somebody else's armor uh, to war with. Uh, but what he's given you is where you're going to be successful. And that's why there's a scripture that says, and this is one I have uh, demonstrated actually in my office, but there's a scripture that says, your gift will make room for you. All right. And so Shelly had given me a gift. It was in a black bag with some gold paper that I just saved because it reminded me of this scripture about your gift will make room for you. Uh, where you are will cause you to be successful. But let's look over. I want to have you look at maybe one other uh, scripture with me today. Uh, and we're going to look in uh, Ephesians. And we're going to look in uh, chapter 6 just really quick. Or I may just highlight just a few things there. Ephesians chapter 6 talks a little bit about the war that happens against the authenticity that God has for us. And uh, I'll read a, read a little bit of this. We'll look in uh, chapter 6 and verse 10. <clears throat> it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, take up the shield of faith, and with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and with all prayer and, and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit with this in view, and be on, alert, on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And then it goes on to say to pray that uh, there would be a granting to, for his mouth to be open. But I want to uh, say just a couple things about uh, this scripture. Uh, and the first one is uh, this is something that we need to know to be effectual, and that is that every day there's going to be a battle. Uh, that when we wake up in the morning, we are in war, right? Uh, w ever since we've been born again, uh, we're called uh, to be warriors in the kingdom of God. Uh, the interesting part about this wrestling, you know, a lot of times when we think of 
uh, wrestling. We may think of the pro wrestling that's on today that's all kind of choreographed and staged to uh, the MM, I don't know what the, one, the other one is, the, the rougher one, the more real one, the MMA or whatever that is. But, uh, but these wrestling matches uh, were actually ones where you either lived or died. Right? There was only one winner uh, when you went into this match. Uh, and so either you died or your opponent died. Uh, that was the way they were laid out. And whether it was, uh, they have several different levels that they called wrestling back then, but uh, some of them used different weapons, uh, but they were all had the basic uh, same plan. And that was one person lived, one person died, and there were huge auditoriums where these events were staged and took place, all right? So it'd be like the big football fields of today. There'd be that many people there uh, 80 to 100,000 people sat in these arenas uh, to watch people be killed uh, in these wrestling matches, you know. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're seeing a progressiveness to uh, worse and worse uh, things in that arena in the U.S. right now uh, because I've seen just some excerpts of some of the uh, very violent MMA ones, and they are uh, very violent. I mean, it's not to death yet. Uh, but it's usually to unconsciousness or something very near that, all right? And uh, that's happening today, and people are paying money, pay-per-view TV, uh, you know, making a lot of money uh, uh, seeing people hurt, you know? And so, you know, I'm not, obviously you can probably tell I'm not for that. I don't, I think I, I enjoy athletics, and sports has been a big part of my life uh, for a long time, but I believe that there's lines that have to be drawn uh, in terms of some of the sports that are, are being offered today. Um, but, uh, but in this uh, passage of Scripture, the Lord uh, tells us we're always going to be in a battle, all right, uh, that we're wrestling not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities, uh, rulers of darkness, uh, and with spiritual forces of wickedness. So, so your boss is not really the one you're warring with, right? <laughs> even though it may seem that way, all right? I know the time I worked for a, a Hindu man. Um, he was a, not a, not that he wasn't an unpleasant guy or anything, but there was just a war going on all the time in the spirit. You could feel it all the time. Uh, we just came uh, from a location where there were a lot of Buddhists, uh, and you could feel uh, just the war of the spirit, not that they were hostile or anything like that, uh, but you could just feel that uh, war that was going on. So I want to really just encourage you today um, that this is a season where God wants us to be authentic. Uh, he wants us to uh, be ones that know we're in a battle to war. Uh, and then uh, later tonight, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things the Lord uh, has been speaking to me about uh, the angelic host uh, that's with us. Uh, I had an experience that happened just a few weeks ago. Uh, and we were in some meetings at CI, and um, uh, we had just put uh, property up for sale, uh, for, uh, for sale by owner's sign on a piece of property, a lot that we had. And uh, during one of those meetings, there were some of the revival meetings. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but I'll tell you about that more tonight. But uh, they were during the revival meetings during worship time, and I just kind of had my hands up uh, in worship, uh, we just like had my hands about this level in worship, uh, and I felt all at one time an angel come on each side of me and physically lift my hands up, all right, uh, on each side. It was just kind of like uh, the Aaron and the her with Moses kind of an experience, all right. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, what was this? What just happened? Uh, the very next morning, someone called me about this property and it sold the same day, all right? So now angels get involved in your life, all right? Get involved in doing things in uh, financial realms and health realms and family realms. Uh, and so I know that's, a, that's a, and a, the, one of the most um, realistic experiences that I've had with angels, all right? Uh, where, I, where you could feel it in the physical realm, uh, something happened. Uh, and they're there to do those kind of things, all right? Uh, and the good news is we're stepping into a realm, and I'll talk more about this tonight, uh, but 
this had been the year of a double portion. Uh, uh, this next year that we're moving into is going to continue that in some ways. Uh, but one of the biggest new things that will be happening uh, is that there's going to be an angels on assignment with us in the battles that we're warring in. All right? As things are winding down in the end days and it seems like the demonic forces are rising out of the bowels of the earth, and I think they are, and Bishop even had a word to that effect really, at that very same time, there are going to be angels with us, warring with us uh, in daily realms uh, if we're saying the things that attract them, right? Uh, and if we're speaking the things uh, that will cause them to be around. It says the angels hearken to the voice of the Lord, right? Uh, and hearken to the word of the Lord. So as we're speaking the word, of course, that's what Jesus did to defeat Satan even, was speak the word. As we are willing to do that, and as we act upon it and really do it, you know, it takes action to make it happen, uh, we're going to see some great things happen. And angels are, will get you some victories that you were never able to get before, all right, in a lot of different realms. So uh, how many of you are ready to get something like that? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to have you uh, uh, just reach out and touch someone, all right, and take hold of hands with somebody across, maybe across the aisle. We'll go all the way across here. And if we can all just stand up, maybe. Okay, and I'll have you yeah, stretch across. All right. Look at, look at your neighbor to the right and say, it is time for you to be authentic. <laughs> all right, and then look at your neighbor to the left and say, it's time for you to be authentic. <laughs> All right. Well, Father, I thank you for each one <laughs> here today, Lord. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that this will be a great year of authentic Christianity in the hearts of your people. God, to walk out, to demonstrate, to be and to do. Father, miracle working power, signs and wonders and miracles demonstrated. The life of Jesus demonstrated in your people. And Father, we release that now and we decree it now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right.